you know, the truth. And they're willing to hear the truth in, in language that they can understand. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you tonight about some very challenging issues. If you, uh, if you have a Bible, if you'll take it and turn to the fifth chapter of Luke. I want to read from that. If you don't have a Bible, let me just share it with you. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading with verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he, now that is Jesus, of course. And it came to pass on a certain day as Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which would come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed. Now the word is translated bed, but it probably should read uh, a blanket, something like a bedroll. So don't think bed like you think bed, and, uh, like a blanket. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy, he was crippled. And they sought means to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch or, or bedroll into the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this? which speaketh blasphemies. Come on. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts, whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say rise up and walk? Now listen, look at the passage just before we read on. He doesn't say which one is easier to do. He says which one is easier to say. Okay, in other words, he says, anybody can stand up here and say, your sins are forgiven. But how do you know if it really happened? Come on. But what if somebody says, stand up and walk? Yeah. How do you know if he's really healed? Come on. He stands up and walks. That's right. So in other words, Jesus says, by healing this man physically, I'm proving to you that when I forgave him, he really was forgiven. Yes. Come on. And here, he spoke unto the man who was sick, the crippled man. I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Yes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, here we are gathered, just these few men in this place. And we invite you into our midst. Thank you that you are here. And we pray that you would brush aside all of our carefully constructed mechanisms of self-defense. Yes. All the ways that we fought you off, kept you at arm's length, Kick open the door. Come into the inner man of us. Yes. And deal with us whether we like it or not. We're not asking you to make it easy. We're asking you to make it real. Yes. Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. The strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. Have you ever read a passage of scripture and you read it your whole life and you read it a certain way, it's, it's embarrassing to suddenly read it. I've been in the ministry 52 years, I'm not a beginner. And suddenly read a passage and realize there were things in it that you totally and completely missed. Yeah. Yeah. This passage, there is a word I can't believe I never read the Word. I know I read the Word. I read the King James Bible. This is the King James Bible from which I read tonight. But this one word I missed every time I read it. Yes. And when I suddenly saw it, 
Give him the food. They changed this verse. <laughs> Somebody came and changed my Bible. Because you just can't believe it was there the whole time. So it says, Jesus is in this building, in this house, as it were. And it's packed. It's so packed that nobody can even get in the door with this crippled man. It also tells us that the clientele in that room, the people that were in the room, the congregation listening to him, are different from any other place he ever preached in the Bible. It says they were only Pharisees and doctors of the law. The whole room is filled with the religious intelligentsia and leadership of the entire nation. It says they have come from Judea and all are from Jerusalem and all over the country. The top religious leaders of the nation are packed this place out to hear Jesus. I've read that over and over and over again. And then here's the verse. It says, and the power of God was present to heal them. And all my life and ministry, I stopped with the word heal. And the power of God was present to heal. But that's not what it says. Come on. It says the power of God was present to heal them. Yes. But none of them got healed. Mm. The power of God was present to heal them. But none of them got healed. Why couldn't they get healed? Because they were not there to get healed. They were there to analyze Jesus. Yes. They were there to judge him and critique him and study him and take notes on him and argue with him and philosophize with him and to do all of the religious things, but they weren't there to get healed. And it suddenly dawned on me, somebody gets healed in the presence of Jesus because they're there to get healed. If you're just there to experience His presence, or if you're just there to study His presence, or understand His presence, or even preach about His presence, you don't get healed. Who gets healed? Two kinds of people. People that need to get healed and people that want to get healed. Amen. None of them got healed, first of all, because none of them believed they needed healing. That's right. That's right. Now, the second thing in this story that I missed all these years stunned me, and it became the, both the cover of the book and the title of the book. And it's this. If you hear a thousand sermons on the man lowered through the rooftop, how, and let me just ask you, how many of you have ever heard a teaching, a preaching, a sermon at all on the four men that take their friend up and lower him through the rooftop? Will you raise your hand? That's, that's not every single person, but most of us, okay? If you hear a thousand sermons on it, they will always only ever be about two things. The power of Jesus to heal, right? That's a perfectly valid theme. That's the core theme, right? The power of Jesus to heal or the faith of the four men to lower him through the roof. That they had the faith. And Jesus, when he saw their faith, okay? The faith of the four men. But there's another variable. This is what I miss. Look, imagine you're completely crippled. You're so crippled you can't move. You just lay on a bed. You're maybe a beggar. And four of your friends come to you and they say, we're going to drag you up on the top of that building. And then they get you up on the top of the building. They remove the ceiling tiles. They tie four ropes around the corners of your blanket. And they tell you, we're going to lower you into that room. That's a high-risk situation, boys. <laughs> what, if, what if somebody lets go of one corner? They're just going to tumble that poor guy. Oh, okay, he's crippled. That beats being dead. You drop somebody onto that floor room, it could kill him. There's other risks. He is being lowered into a room 
Not with common, ordinary guys like you and me. That's right. Go ahead. He is being lowered into the presence of the religious leadership, smug, sanctimonious, self-righteous religious leaders of the whole nation. Yeah. What if they say, get him out of here. Get him out of here. He has spent his whole life living on a blanket over in the corner, just trying to stay out of everybody's way. Wait for somebody to bring him a bowl of porridge. He doesn't want to be exposed in public. He doesn't want some child pointing at him. What's the matter with him, mommy? Look at him. And he doesn't want these religious doctors of the law saying, you're crippled because you deserve it. You're crippled because God is punishing you because you're a sinner. That's what they thought. There's another risk. We read Luke chapter 5. He hadn't. He hadn't read Luke chapter 5. He didn't know how this ends. He's hoping Jesus will heal him. At least his four friends are. They're hoping Jesus will heal him. But the fact of the matter is, they don't know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. What if they let alone him? Look, he's talking to the to religious leaders, seminary professors, and pastors, and big shots all in the room. And this guy comes down, lower down in the middle. What if Jesus says, I'm in the middle of my sermon? Get, get that thing out of here. Just one more rejection. One more shattered hope. One more moment of disillusioned and disabused faith. It's high risk. I never saw it before. So there must have been a moment up on that rooftop when those four men tied those ropes around the corners of his blanket and they looked him in the eye and said, okay, are you ready? Are you ready? So the variable in that moment is not faith. It's courage. <laughs> Sometimes, I know faith is a variable. I'm not saying it's the only variable. I'm not, I'm, but it is a variable. But courage can be a variable, particularly when it comes to inner healing. When it comes to the healing of damaged emotions. Yeah. Now, I, I'm willing to pray tonight with people who need physical healing. I do that. I pray it. I believe in it. I know God heals. We've heard testimonies about it tonight. But tonight, I'm going to challenge you, not about physical healing, but about spiritual, em emotional healing. The, the healing from damaged emotions. And I'm telling you, to get healed of that takes more courage than any other kind of healing, and it takes more courage than most people have. Go ahead. Amen. Look. If you're at odds with everybody in your family, if you if you if you if you all your family relationships are broken. You got two ex-wives that hate your guts and your children don't like you and then you got brothers and sisters that won't speak to you, whatever it is, you're at odds with everybody in your family. Has it occurred to you that the only constant amidst all those variables is you? At some point or another, you have to come to the place where you quit blaming your mother-in-law. And you allow the Holy Ghost to hold that mirror up to you and say, look, there's the issue. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you, nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. I don't like it. I've always said the Holy Ghost is like an American physician. Do you ever go to a doctor with a sore place on your arm? You go in a second. Sore place on my arm right here really hurts. What's the first thing that idiot will do? He'll push on it. So what about that? Does that hurt? I said, yes, it hurts. I told you it hurt. That's why I came in here. What does he do? He keeps pushing. What about this? What, about this? what if I lift your arm up like that? What if I kick you? Is that how I 
The Holy Ghost is like that. that that's the reason. You, you ever hear people, you have friends, don't you? Some of them that won't go to church. And, they, and they do all kinds of stuff. They say all this stuff. Oh, I don't go to church. It's all full of phonies. I don't like this. It's a bunch of hypocrites. I don't like the music. I don't like the preacher. Something. But then they'll say to you, I don't go to church because I don't believe any of it. They're lying. If they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wouldn't be there or deal with them, and that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that none of it was real, they'd go. What they're afraid of is exactly what a lot of Christians have forgotten. It's not safe to go to church. It's not safe for you to be here tonight. I'm not saying it's not good. It is good. I'm just saying it's not safe. Because when you're in the presence of God, He can access anything in your life. I've seen people get, I've seen people get so mad in church. I've been threatened. I was preaching a camp meeting near Gainesville, Georgia one time. In the middle of my sermon, a guy got up and started up the aisle. He's pulling his jacket off. He said, I'm fixing to whoop you. He said, I'm a... And he's starting toward me, you know. And I thought, hey, you know, how about some of y'all, you know, hinder him? <laughs> I felt like he had pretty clear access as far as I could see. And he's screaming, nobody's going to curse like that from the platform of this camp meeting. And he's talking about me cursing and cursing and all this kind of thing. Some guys grabbed him, they got him, they drug him out of the camp meeting. I, listen, I was shaken. I was 30 years old. I, I was shaken, you know, I didn't know what to think. They took him out. I started to preach again. He went around, came out, and came on the end of the platform. Came out again. He says, he said, I'm telling you, I, you're not gonna, you're not gonna curse like that on this platform. Some guys grabbed him and drug him out. I was very shaken. When I got to my room, the room they had for me there, anybody remember cassette players? Can you remember that? Thank oh, God, that's an antique. I had a little cassette player, and I, I, went to the, I went to the sound booth, and I said, did you record that sermon or not? They said, yes, uh, Brother Rutland, we did. I said, well, let me have a cassette. I took it in my room and put it in my little cassette player, and I thought, you know, I had a misspent youth. Maybe I got all cranked up in the pulpit and said something, you know. Y'all are all so religious, you don't know any bad words, but I... <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe. I got heated up, said something. So I was listening to the sermon, and there was a knock on my door. It was an old man. He said, can I, can I speak to you, Brother Rutland? And I said, yes. He said, I heard this sermon going. He said, you're listening to your sermon, aren't you? I said, sir, if I said something bad, if I said a curse on that platform, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up on the platform tomorrow and apologize. I'm, I'll do it. He said, turn it off. He said, you didn't curse. He said, do you know who that man is? I said, I've never seen him before in my life. I've never been here before. He said, he's, a, he's the head of the Ku Klux Klan in this county. He said, I want you to think back. What were you preaching on when he started toward the platform? And I said, I, I can't remember. He shook me so bad, I can't remember. He said, you were preaching that racial prejudice is the sin of murder. And he, the only curse he heard was the curse on his own life. Yeah. And then he said something I remember 40 years later. And he didn't have the guts to let God deal with him. And the power of God was present to heal them. But none of them got healed. My goodness, come on. Fine. We could spend our lives defending ourselves. Or we, or we can allow God to have access to us and deal with us. I, uh, I have come to believe 
that there are things inside of us that can take root, that can fester, abscess, and ooze poison. Toxins, toxic rivers. I was the president of two different Christian universities, substantial Christian universities, thousands of students, for 16 years divided between two different universities. I didn't do a lot of counseling, but I did some. The only counseling I do now is with pastors, preachers who are in crisis. I don't, I don't do counseling, but I did counseling at those universities. You know what was the number one cause of counseling that I had to do with Christian students at Christian universities for 16 years? It was the, it was the inconsistencies that they saw in their fathers. That's right. Second and third generation Pentecostals who heard their fathers stand up in Sunday morning church and give a word of prophecy and then talk to their mother in the car on the way home like she was a dog. And they couldn't deal with it. Cause all of that. We spend our lives trying to cover it over and fight it off and defend ourselves and blame it on everybody else. And all that does is make us phonier. It just, it just makes us into fakes. I heard about a young man who came and sat down at a bus stop and he realized the only other person at the bus stop was a Catholic nun. You know, the habit on everything. He looked at her and looked all around and he turned to her and he said, look, sister, I, I don't want to offend you. But he said, I've always had a kind of a crazy dream that someday I could, I'd like to kiss a nun. And he said, I don't know why, I just always wanted to kiss a nun. And he said, what would it hurt? Nobody's around here. If I could just lean over and just give you a little, just a little kiss on the cheek like that, what would that hurt? And I could die happy. The nun looked all around and said, well, I don't see what that would hurt. I'll let you kiss me on two conditions. You have to be single and you have to be Catholic. He said, this is perfect. I am single and I am a Catholic. She said, okay then, what would it hurt? He leaned over and kissed her on the cheek and then he laughed in her face. He said, well, the joke's on you, sister. He said, I, I'm married and I'm a Baptist. She said, no, the joke's on you. My name's Kevin. I'm on my way to a costume party. <laughs> if, we, if, we can't find, if we can't find the courage to be honest with ourselves and honest with God, we just turn church into nothing but a glorified costume party. And we're all pretending to believe each other's costumes. We enter into a mutually agreed upon covenant of suspended disbelief. And the church can be filled with people that are hurting and wounded and angry and disconnected from each other and from their families and from God. And we're all acting like everything's great. And if you think for one moment I'm only talking about people that sit in the pew, I'm talking about people that stand behind this desk. Yeah, amen. That's right. I was the pastor of a mega church in Orlando, Florida. One day, a pastor of a little tiny Presbyterian church down the road came to my office, said, came in, hi, introduced myself, I'm glad to see you. It was awkward. He, he didn't have much to say. And, I said, would you like some coffee? Sure. My secretary brought coffee in. But it, it, the conversation just never went anywhere. And I, even, even when he left, my secretary said, what do you think that was about? I said, really? I, I don't know. Two hours later, he went into the study of that little Presbyterian church and put a gun in his mouth and sh shot his head off. And all these years, it has haunted me that I missed something. That I should have seen something or heard pain in his voice or seen the shadows in his eyes or something. Was there some way that I just missed it completely that I, I could have said something? And, and 
And I've struggled with things in my own life. Look at it. They, the, tonight the band sang so beautifully as blood reaches to the lowest valley. Amen. But that, that's just words unless you've ever been in a Judge low on. valley. Until right. you've ever been. I've, I've been. I've stood with my toes over the abyss. Realizing that my life and my marriage and my ministry and, and my hope and my eternity were all hanging, hanging by a monofilament. Standing in the pine forest behind my father's house with a desert eagle. 357 Magnum. Until you've, until you've come that close to blowing your own head off, you can't understand what makes a little Presbyterian minister so, on, what? Brother. I don't know. Defeated? Hurt? Wounded? Angry, depressed. Last week, a very prominent minister in California yeah. killed himself. My, you know what my first thought was? I wish, I wish he just could have taken one hour and read this book. I believe the, that basically the the five toxins, the the things that that control our lives are basically five things. Listen to these and see which one of them sounds the most familiar to you. Shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear. Basically, it's one of those five that just tortures people. Shame. Here's a, here's a chief executive of a big company, successful. Powerful, wealthy, prosperous man who's gotten his life and his marriage in such a mess, making terrible, reckless decisions sexually until he's in a, a nightmare of a mess. Finally agrees to go for counseling. We work back through it. Counselor working with him, bringing him back and further and further until that man begins to be more and more defensive and angrier and suddenly uh, you sense in counseling you're getting close to something and you press in and press in until finally it explodes. When he was 14 years old, he was violently raped. Not fondled, not inappropriately touched, violently raped when he was 14. But he... He takes that shame of that so deep inside of him. All shame rests in deception. Come on. Satan is a liar and he's a father of lies. Yes. Amen. And there's some, some lie that that, this, that that shame hangs on, that sits in. I call it a throne. Yeah. Yeah. There's some kind of a throne mm -hmm. that, that controls that shame. What is the lie? For him the lie was, the only person that can be raped is a woman. So if he was raped, what does it mean about his own sense of personal identity? His own concept of himself as a man? So he has to say, if I was raped, what am I? Therefore, what? I wasn't raped. He simply enters into denial. He pushes it back. He smothers it. He depresses it. He represses it. But it becomes the beast under the floorboards. Yeah. It's there 30 years yeah. growling under the floorboards, terrifying him. That it'll finally poke its horrifying head out until finally in counseling it erupts. All right, all right, he screams, all right, I was raped. Why do I have to say it? And you say... Because it's the truth. Because it's the truth. Do you know what is the therapeutic, the biblical therapy that tears down the throne of deception, that heals us of shame? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. <laughs> I 
wonder if any of you have ever been in the lobby of the Central Intelligence Building near Washington, D.C. Do you know what's written? Carved into the wall of the lobby of the Central Intelligence Agency? You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I'm not saying anybody in that building believes that. I'm just saying it's in the lobby. But facing, dealing with the truth, this is what I did. This is what was done to me. This is the reality. A businessman I counseled with, he started passing out. Just passing out. They tested him for epilepsy. They tested everything in the world. His son-in-law was a Methodist preacher who was my dear friend. And they brought him to me and I began counseling with him. And we went back to the whole thing. The whole thing was shame. Right. Because he had been raised in a family that was just like there were mountain people in, in the holler in Kentucky. His, his mother was just basically insane. His father, would, they were just this kind of, you know what I'm talking about, toothless people living in the mountains of Kentucky. And he had escaped that and gone to college and gone to graduate school. And he'd become the executive vice president for a whole region of a major engineering firm. And he had told his family a lie about his family. That his parents had been killed in a car crash. That he was an orphan. That he had been raised an orphan. He created this entire lie. Because he was so riddled with shame. What does that shame hang on? A lie. What is the lie? If my wife and my kids and my colleagues know where I came from, they won't have any respect for me and they won't love me. So what is the truth? The truth is, none of that is me. Man. So listen to me, guys. You are not anything that was ever done to you. That's right. Yeah. You are not anything that your parents did. Nobody lives their whole life in the shadow of a jailhouse. Whatever your dad did, that's on him. Whatever your mother was or wasn't, that's, that's on her. Mm -hmm. Satan says that reveals something about you. So those words creep into a little boy's mind. Nasty. You're nasty. You're dirty. You're weak. You're stupid. You're a failure. That's the lie. That's the voice of the lie. I have a wonderful friend told me that when he was about five, his father died and his mother made an unfortunate remarriage. Cruel and violent man. And he resented the presence of that little boy in the home, so he refused to call him by his name. He said, I'm going to give you a, a new name. And it was horrible. It was a vulgar obscenity. And he said, that's the only name I'm ever going to call you. And he said, if I call that, you better answer me. So for a year and a half, he pours that into him. The little boy started the first grade. First day of first grade, he's sitting right there right where you are, all the children in a row, and the new teacher says, all right, I want everybody to go and tell me your name. And he's the first student, and he says, she says to him, what's your name? And he said it. What he had been pounded into him for a year and a half. It was horrible, and the other kids are all screaming with laughter. Thank God that teacher could have sent him to the principal's office, had him eject everything else. After class, she asked him, who told you that was your name? Who told you? And he told her, he told her that. And she said, now here's what we're going to do. You come to school every morning, five minutes early, and you're going to stand by my desk and I'm going to teach you. And the other kids go to recess, you'll stay in here five minutes. At the end of school, you'll stay with me five minutes. Every day for 15 minutes, she made him repeat, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, yeah. I'm capable, I'm loved, I'm beautiful, I'm important. Day after day after day yeah. after day. And he is a Methodist preacher today with a master's degree because that school teacher yeah. deprived Satan of, this, of the horrible yeah. lie that brought shame into that child's life. 
Shame, shame is only one of the poisons. I, I'm not going to go through them all. But I, let me just mention them. Shame, unforgiveness is another. Unforgiveness meaning unforgiveness toward others. I counseled with a, a man in Dallas, Texas. He had uh, inherited a substantial ranch west of Fort Worth from his father, who inherited it from his father. Then it went back to the old west. Married a woman, the woman had an affair with her lawyer. Her lawyer sued him, they got a divorce. He was in hock on the ranch, made, managed to make it, but he couldn't, he didn't have the cash flow to pay that ranch off. And the judge ruled that he had to pay her for half the ranch. He didn't have it. They auctioned the ranch off. Who do you think bought the ranch? The lawyer. He sat in my office. He said, my ex-wife and that lawyer are living together on my great-grandfather's ranch. He was so angry and hurt and wounded. Lashed out at everybody. Angry at everybody all the time. We began to work back toward it. When we came to the issue of forgiveness, he said to me, he said, you tell me the truth. Could you forgive that? He said, don't lie to me. Could you forgive that? I said, my God, no. He said, that's unforgivable. I said, yes, it's unforgivable. He said, see, nobody ever expects a preacher to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's unforgivable. I said, it's unforgivable. He said, and you couldn't forgive it? No, I couldn't. He said, but you expect me to? I said, I never said that. I said, forgiveness will set you free. I didn't say you could forgive her. You can't forgive her. You can't forgive that lawyer. You can't forgive that judge. I said, the issue is, I know a guy who's really good at forgiving the unforgivable. I said, what, what is the worst sin that can ever be committed? In the whole world, what's the worst sin? Killing God. It's called deicide. To kill God is the worst sin imaginable. Imagine if you kill God and while God is dying, he says, I forgive you. I said, when we want unforgiveness to flow through us for the unforgivable, what we do is find the courage to say, Lord, come into me and flow through me. And I release your forgiveness to flow through me until finally you can say, I forgive. Yeah. I forgive. I forgive. But it's the power of God flowing through yeah. you to forgive. So I was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit one night at a Methodist church in Akron, Ohio. Near there. When I gave the invitation, a great big man. Looked like one of these guys in the band. <laughs> big guy came up and he fell you know some Methodist church with a little wooden communion rail you know what I'm talking about he hit that communion rail he nearly knocked it over he was great big crying I went over to him and I, I said friend do you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he said I want the baptism but he said I, I can't receive I said why not is there something blocking it he said I'm the deputy sheriff in this county he said, two years ago, I answered a shooting call at a local bar. When I went there, I found out that a man had put a sawed-off shotgun against a woman's belly button and cut her in half. He said, I disarmed him, put the cuffs on him, and I turned the corpse over, and it was my daughter. And he said, I hate that man. He said, I hate that man so bad. He said, if I could put a gun in his mouth, I'd blow his brains out. He said, I plotted it, I planned it, I thought of ways I could kill him, I could get him killed in prison. He's in the state penitentiary now and I hate him. And he said, that hatred is standing between me yep. and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I said, the issue here is, do you have the courage to get healed? <laughs> I said, I know you got the courage to shoot him. Do you have the courage to get healed? Do you have the courage to say, Lord Jesus, flow into me? Make me courageous enough to forgive my daughter's murderer. Because until you have the courage to allow that to happen, that poison is going to eat you alive from the inside. I think there are men in this room that hate somebody. Yes. I mean hate somebody. 
How can you ever get healed of that? I haven't the courage to say, come Holy Spirit. So I had the pastor kneel down on the other side of the communion rail. And I said to that great big sheriff, I want you to imagine that your daughter's murderer is kneeling across the communion rail from you. And God says to you, I'm going to let you choose for him, heaven or hell. You choose. If you want him to go to hell, I'll let him go to hell. If you want him to go to heaven, I'll let him go to heaven. But whatever you choose, you choose it for yourself too. I said, if you want heaven, get him heaven. I watched him, his body shook like a leaf in a wind tunnel. He reached his hands out like that. He reached his hands out and when he touched that preacher's head, he said, all right, I forgive you. I forgive you. God filled him with the Holy Spirit. Right there. The next night, I got to the service. It was one of the, you know, revivals that went three or four or five nights. I got to the church the next night, and the sheriff and his wife weren't there. I was so disappointed. I said, oh, man, are you kidding me? It didn't even last 24 hours. And the preacher said, now, Dr. Rutherford, calm down. He said, they're not here because they've driven to the state penitentiary to meet with their daughter's murderer. <laughs> That's not the work for sissies, boys. That's right. That's not the work for lightweights. Wow. Come on. That takes courage. That takes, well, I, I can't say this in church, but I can say that takes guts. Yeah. Condemnation is a horrible poison. What is, it, what, what is that poison rest in? Condemnation is different from unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is what I have toward you. Condemnation is what I have toward myself. Yeah. You ever hear anybody say this? Mm -hmm. If you've ever said it, I know you'll never say it again. But have you ever heard anybody say this? I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Yeah. How many have ever heard that anyway? Will you raise your hand? All right. Now listen to me. I don't mean to be harsh, but listen to what I'm going to say to you. I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. What's the answer to that? Who do you think you are? That's right. I mean, who do you think you are? Yeah, come on. The throne in which condemnation rests is actually idolatry, not guilt. Come on. I idolize my own judgment and discernment. I claim to be a more righteous judge than the God of the universe. So God says, I forgive you. And I say, no, I know better than you do. <laughs> so my, my condemnation is rooted in the idolatry of my own self-analysis. What tears that throne down? What pulls that down? Yeah. Worship. Yeah. When yeah. I begin, and I'm not just talking about singing in church, guys. Yeah. I'm talking about... When I put God back on the throne of my life and begin to adore Him as yeah. He is, I no longer have confidence in my judgment on myself. When I see who God is, I accept His grace on my life instead of my judgment and condemnation. Amen. Well, let me give you one last one. Fear. Okay, do you understand about the thrones? Do you understand what I'm saying? That the poison flows out of a throne. Uh, you remember in the book of Ezekiel, the river of life flows out of the, out of the altar of life? Okay, I believe the river of poison flows out of a throne of, of satanic death. So each, each of those toxic rivers, shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear, they all flow out of a throne. What's the throne that fear for us? And there are people that live their lives so afraid. What is it? What is it rest in? Pain. The throne that fear rests in is pain. See, psychologists, scientists will tell us that you cannot actually remember a pain. You only remember that it hurt. You remember that it hurt a lot or a little bit, but you can't actually remember the physical sensation of a pain. So do you know what you do? You, you alter the narrative of that pain. Yeah. Wow. And if fear takes hold, 
you narrate it up. By the same token, if you haven't had the pain yet, you fear the pain and you create a narrative around that that magnifies the possibility of the pain and cripples you. Do you ever take a child to the doctor and the nurse comes in with a hypodermic needle and that child wigs out? Why, it's because they create a narrative around that hypodermic needle. This is going to kill me. They're going to stick it in my eyeball or something. <laughs> right? So they create this narrative around this pain which debilitates them. Yeah. So I spent a year counseling with an old lady in Orlando who had agoraphobia. I wonder if you know what agoraphobia it means. Uh, it's from the Latin word agora, which means a marketplace. So it's the fear of being outside, of being in a, a group, in a crowd, in a marketplace. She couldn't go to the mall, then she couldn't even go in her front yard. She stayed in her house. So her grown son, she's an elderly lady, her grown son got me to counsel with her. I'd go to her house, meet with her. At first I began by trying to tell her nothing bad would happen to her at the mall. Her son would guard her. There'd be security guards, all these things. It, it didn't even make a dent. And so finally, you know what I did? I reversed the course. Instead of trying to convince her that nothing bad would happen to her at the shopping mall, I began to tell her all the bad things that might happen to her in her house. I said, you think you're safe in this house? You are not safe. I said, this is not a great neighborhood. Somebody break in here and kill you. They cut your head off. She said, she said Dr. Ellen, are you trying to help? Because she said, this does not feel like you're helping me. And I said, I'm trying to show you God never promised you a pain-free life. You are trying to create a pain-free existence that doesn't happen. So therefore, what is the answer? What, what is that therapy, that biblical truth that tears down fear? We know it. Perfect love cast it out all yeah. Yes. So if I, I'm going into a situation where, where the fear of potential pain, I could get hurt, I could get killed, I could get disappointed, I could have emotional pain, I could have re all of these things, I create this, this narrative, this lie around that pain, and it pours fear into my life. What breaks that? What tears that throne down? Inviting the God of love not to deliver me from pain, but come into the pain with me. Yes. Come into this with me. Yes. Let me experience you in this pain. So if I'm standing in the cell block talking to a guy who's spending his first night in jail, and he's terrified. He's heard everything that can happen to him, and he has created a narrative around that that is crippling him. He is, he is encased in fear. Should, should, I, should I try to free him from a lie by telling him a lie? Come on. Should I tell him no, nothing's going to happen to you in here? Well, that's, all, that, that's potentially a lie. What I can say to him is, Jesus spent the last night of his life on death row. Amen. There's nothing you're going to face in here that, he, that freaks Jesus out. Yeah. That's good. I'm not, I'm not going to pray with you to get out of jail tonight. This is the first on 7 to 20. You're going to do hard time, son. But what I'm going to pray is that Jesus will be in every moment of yes. that with you. And it breaks the power of fear. Now, why won't men go to somebody and get help? Why won't a grown man go and get help? One reason is one reason is because we we're told from the time we start little league, big boys don't cry. You don't want to show any pain or any emotion. It's one of the reasons that we can't have a meaningful conversation with our own wives. Because we're so terrified that our wife will see that we're vulnerable or hurt or wounded. 
or that there's a frightened little boy inside there, so we create this mirage around her. And we, and we isolate ourselves from her. We push her away. Come on. Some of you have a woman at home that is aching, longing yes. to have an intimate relationship with you. My and I'm not talking about intimate sex. I'm talking about an intimate relationship. Yes. Who would love to know what you think and how you feel and what you went through and why the prob what the problems are in your life. And you are terrified that she will find out what you went through. What you're afraid of. What you deal with. She's longing for that. She's longing for it. One reason we won't get help is because big boys don't cry. Another reason we won't get help is because sometimes the church has said, unfortunately, counseling is not of God. I, I, I've seen these angry Pentecostal evangelists on TV railing on counseling. Paling counseling is not in the Bible. Counsel, you don't need counseling. You just need Jesus. You know what I always think when I see that? You need counseling. <laughs> Another reason we won't get help is because I hear this. People say, Jesus never did counseling. Jesus didn't do inner healing. Well, yes, he did. Come on. I'll give you one example. I just read it to you. Yes. I just read it to you. When that man is lowered into Jesus' presence, everybody in the room, the ones who are judging Jesus, and the four men on the rooftop, all want him physically healed. But Jesus doesn't say, rise up and walk. What does he say? Your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus discerned, I'm not saying everybody that's crippled has hidden guilt. I'm saying that man, Jesus sensed, that man could not receive or sustain a physical healing until he was relieved, healed of the condemnation that was inside of him. So Jesus dealt with the inner man. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And the healing began. It became physical. But it began in a moment of inner healing. But let me give you a different one. As we close, listen, let me share a different one with you. I want to say this to you. I went through counseling. Some years ago, I went through two years of counseling. I said that to a room full of preachers not so long ago, and I mean, there was an audible gasp. There was a gasp. <laughs> Afterward, a man came up, a preacher came to me, and he said, why did you go to counseling? Why did you go? I said, because I need it. <laughs> I needed it. I need it. Every one of us has got gunk in our gears. Yes, come on. Every one of us, all of us are getting over something. Yeah. Sometimes we face it, sometimes we've got the guts for it, sometimes we cover it over. Oh, that didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. But there's a man sitting in this house. I'm, I'm not know you. I'm not. I'm just saying. I guarantee you, in a room full of men, this many men, there's a man sitting here in this room whose father said something to him at some point in his childhood that still sticks in your soul. Yeah. You stupid little brat. Yeah. Something, and it's still there. And you've tried to get it out. You've tried to paint over it, and it just abscesses and oozes poison. And you may need to just sit down with somebody and who knows what they're doing and process it and get healed. And that doesn't make you evil or bad or stupid or a failure or anything else. You know what it makes you? Human. That's right. So let's, let me close with this. And you've been very patient tonight. This may not be the sermon you thought you were going to get tonight. This is not a big cranked up Pentecostal message. But this is my last time to speak to you, and I want to say something to you. We need to get well, boys. Amen. Come on. We need to get well. Thank you, Jesus. We're not supposed to live these wounded, hurt, beat up, angry, poisonous lives. That's right. The people around us who are hurting. I want you to imagine if every one of you were out of here and your wives were sitting here. <laughs> 
And I said, anybody got anything to say? And one wife after another said, oh my God, will somebody fix my husband? <laughs> Did Jesus do inner healing? Did he actually ever have a counseling session and heal somebody's wounds? In John chapter 21, after his death, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, Come on. the disciples are deeply wounded. Yeah. They're deeply wounded. They've been through a shattering emotional collapse. Look, the guy they thought was the Messiah has been killed. They thought they had the stairway to the heavens and they got the elevator shaft. It's over. They saw him killed, buried. One of their number has killed himself. He's committed suicide because he didn't get healed. Come on. Simon Peter, that everybody thought was the big man, turned out to be a craven, gutless little coward. He denied Jesus three times, the third time with a curse in his mouth. Yes. In Caiaphas' courtyard, the little maid said, you were with Jesus, weren't you? No, I wasn't. Somebody else, you were with Jesus, weren't you? No, I wasn't. The third person, were you with Jesus? No, no, hell no. They said, okay, now we believe you. <laughs> the third time he says, with a curse in his mouth. So he's turned out not to be what you thought. Judas is killed himself, pretty shattered. And Peter says, I'm going back to Galilee and I'm going back to fishing. This is not working. And they said, we'll come too. So they go in the boat, they fish all night and they don't catch anything. The next morning, there's a man standing on the shore and he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch. They throw the net, pull it up, and it's bulging with fish. What is that? That's the recreation of the scene where Jesus called them to the ministry. That's right. Henceforth, I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus takes them back in their memory to the moment of encounter, and they recognize Jesus in that memory. Yes. And John, not Peter, Peter's like us. It's a big old dumb guy. You know. John, this sensitive, discerning what John says, that's Jesus. And Peter does the most amazing thing. He jumps in the lake. Don't you know the other guys said, well, okay. <laughs> and they're rowing the boat to shore. Peter jumps in and swims to shore. Why? You could say it's just because he was impetuous, but I know why. Did anybody else in this room, and I'm the only one that misbehaved at school. <laughs> well, when I was in school, you misbehaved in school, they did not give you time out. Come on. They will whoop you. <laughs> Does anybody else, that, not spankings. Yes. Does anybody even understand what I'm, anybody here from the South, yes, anybody sir. understand whooping? Woo! They took you to the principal and the principal will whoop you. And then when I got home and told my mother, the principal, well, she whooped me again. <laughs> but when I got sent to the principal's office for what I knew was going to happen, I didn't want my friends to watch. Peter knows he's going to get a tongue lashing when he gets to the shore. He knows the last time he and Jesus saw each other, Peter was warming his hands on Caiaphas courtyard and he said no no hell no the rooster crowed the door opened and Jesus walked across the courtyard and looked, looked Peter right straight in the eye that's the last time they saw each other so he knows when he goes to Jesus Jesus is going to say you rat you snivelly little rat I told you that you'd deny me oh no you said all these other guys, man, but I'll follow you to the death. Well, good for you. Everybody else can have something to eat. You just sit over there on that rock. <laughs> he knows that's what's going to happen. So he comes up out of the lake. There's nothing in the world colder than lake water at dawn. He comes up out of that lake dripping wet. And the Bible says Jesus is sitting in front of a charcoal fire. 
There is, it is absolutely irrepressible. You come in out of a cold night and there's a fire in the fireplace, you cannot stop yourself. You, you, depending, maybe it's cold, you know, you, but he starts toward that charcoal fire and reaches his hands out and across the charcoal fire, he looks into Jesus' eyes. Now listen to me. There are only two places in the entire New Testament where a charcoal fire is mentioned. Come on. One is on the beach in John chapter 21. The other one is in Caiaphas' courtyard. Mm -hmm. Peter warms his hands at a charcoal fire and denies Jesus and their eyes meet. <laughs> Jesus recreates the scene, takes him back. Yes. He counsels him back to the moment of his failure <laughs> yeah. where condemnation could take root and he could have killed himself like Judas did. Come on. Instead, Jesus says, I haven't brought you to this place to show you your failure. I brought you to this place to show you my grace. Yes. And he says, now, have some breakfast. <laughs> then he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I, I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Why three times? Do you know Jesus? Never heard of him. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Do you know Jesus? He, not, he recreates his failure in order to invite him now into restoration, not only restoration of forgiveness, what he says now, feed my sheep. In other words, he not only restores him to relationship and to forgiveness, he restores him to ministerial leadership. I talked with a pastor not too long ago and another pastor's name came up and I said, I don't, I don't know who that guy is. And he said, no, you don't know him. He's in our denomination. He had a moral failure and he got restored. And I said, no, he wasn't restored. And he said, yeah, 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 he was restored. I said, no, he wasn't. If he was restored, you wouldn't be telling me about the failure. Come on. Jesus never mentions it again. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then do the ministry I called you to. Yes. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then do the ministry I've, I've called you to. Do you love me, Lord? Lord, you know that I love you. Then do the ministry I've called you to. Well, let me close with this. I saw a survey some years ago. They asked, the, it was a magazine survey, they asked all their subscribers, what do you most want somebody else to say to you? What, what do you like to hear somebody say to you more than anything else? They took all these thousands of answers and came up with the top three. I guess the first one, and I bet you can guess it. Americans are fascinated with it. We adore it. We make TV shows about it, movies, everything else. What do we most want somebody else to say to us? I love you. I love you. I love you. I, love you. I knew it. I love you. The second one shocked me. I forgive you. We live under a load of guilt and condemnation and we don't know what to do with it. I believe you could stand on a street corner in downtown Atlanta and when people walk by you could just say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. I think people would say, hey, thanks, man. I'll never do it again. <laughs> because we, honest to God, we, don't, we know there's sin in there. We don't know what to do with it. I love you and I forgive you. The third one made me laugh out loud. You know what it was? Supper's ready. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I laughed and then it hit me. Oh my God. That's the whole law and the prophets. That's the gospel. That's the whole thing. I don't know if there are any pastors in this room, but listen to Dr. Mark. When you serve Holy Communion, that's all you've got. You stand behind that sacred table and extend the elements to your people and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I love you, I forgive you, 
Supper's ready. Come and dine, the master calls. Come and dine. God wants you well. He wants rejection swallowed up in acceptance. He wants fear defeated by love. He wants yeah. condemnation to totally and completely healed by His mercy and grace. He doesn't want us to live cooped up, wounded, angry, toxic lives. There's so much talk in America now about toxic masculinity. And it's real. It's just that the people that are talking about it don't know what it is. They think toxic masculinity is just because you put on a pair of cowboy boots and it'll make America great again in that. That's not toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is when there is so much poison inside of you that it oozes out on your wife and kids. Now that's toxic. And God wants us healed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes, if you will. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take this simple little teaching tonight. Pry open all the locked closets. All those places where we've hidden things away and stored things. God, have mercy on us. Save us and we shall be saved. Heal us and we shall be healed. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. He said, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? I've got some toxicity, some poison flowing in my life, and I need to be healed. And just raise your hand and take it right back down. Sure, so many, so many, so many, so many. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you will invade that very place, that you will flow into that pain or to that condemnation, or to that fear, or to that rejection. Lord, that you will be there with your healing love and grace. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I'm counseling you from the bottom of my heart. Go to somebody. Go to your pastor. Go to a counselor. Go to somebody and say, I have some stuff I have to deal with. I've got to get well. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will come with your healing grace. Forgive, redeem, restore, tear down every throne of evil and dry up every toxic river. In the wonderful, sweet, holy name, Jesus. Now, if you need prayer for physical healing, would you raise your hand right where you are? I'm just going to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, you see their hands. You know their needs they're exactly what they're facing. I pray, God, that you will touch them. Flow into their body, eyes, minds, ears, internal organs, skeletal structure of their body. Drive out everything that would harm them and straighten that which is crooked and smooth that which is rough. Come, Holy Spirit. Friend, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, receive the touch from God and be made whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen to me. That's the end of that message. I've preached here for 40 years. I love you. This is the last time I'm going to do this. Is there anybody here tonight that says, I am not sure I'm a Christian? If I were to die right this minute, if I were to drop down dead in this chair, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven or to hell. Will you raise your hand? Just lift your hand up high and say, I'm just not sure. I'm not, the, I'm not the worst sinner the county's ever seen, but I'm not sure what would happen if I died. Will you lift your hand up? Anybody? All right then. As a Christian to Christians, I accept your testimony. As a Christian to Christians, we must get well. And Jesus, who began our faith, he started writing it. He's the author. He will also finish it. Amen. And he Amen. wants us well. Amen. 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 Amen? I know this is a little bit different, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart tonight. 
God bless you. Señor Dios le bendiga. God bless you, everyone. God bless you.